women behind bars. The image of their prisons in the movies is gritty, tough, crowded and dangerous. Based in part on bad conditions, female convicts have endured throughout history. They have been mixed with drama and violence to form the cultural myth of the women's prison. This is a real prison for women. The United States Federal Reformatory, Alderson, West Virginia. Its buildings dot an isolated hilltop in the shadow of the Allegheny Mountains. When it first opened 70 years ago, it was a vision of prison reform that addressed the needs and crimes of female offenders. A lot of the women who come here, they want to come here, they want to do their time, and they want to get back to their families. Uh, they haven't proven themselves to be the flight risk that men have traditionally been. But what truly highlights this prison are the women who have been confined here. A diverse cross-section from illiterates to college graduates, from spies to prostitutes, from political prisoners to would-be assassins. What they all had in common was that they were about to be locked up in the first federal prison built specifically for women. There was the revolutionary who opened fire on the U.S. House of Representatives. There were the infamous war criminals known as Axis Sally and Tokyo Rose. There was Billie Holiday, the world famous jazz singer. And it was at Alderson where the wife of gangster Machine Gun Kelly was taken to serve her life sentence. The story of Alderson Women's Reformatory begins in the early 1900s when there were no federal prisons for women. There was simply no need, as few women had been convicted of any federal crimes. The 100 or so women who were federal prisoners were swept into filthy and disease-ridden corners of men's jails and workhouses. The United States government paid for their upkeep. Even states that boasted special reformatories for females reserved those for so-called redeemable women. The rest were subject to neglect and sexual abuse by male guards in men's prisons. Their numbers were too small to bring much attention to the problem. Nineteen seventeen saw suffrage groups like the National Women's Party continue their crusade for the women's right to vote. That year, sixteen suffragettes were arrested as they picketed the White House, allegedly for stopping traffic. Their crime brought them a prison term in the District of Columbia workhouse. In the following months, 170 more suffragettes, including National Women's Party leader Alice Paul, were sentenced to jails and workhouses in Washington, D.C. As the wives and daughters of influential men, as well as members of a national organization, their stories of conditions for women in prisons made headlines. They reported humiliating, forced stripping for baths, slave labor conditions, food that was infested with vermin, and a rigid system of silence. This was enforced with threats of beatings and a torture of near drowning called the water cure. Through accounts like these, Americans got their first glimpse at the appalling state of women behind bars. And the problem would increase as new federal laws sent the number of women convicted of federal crimes skyrocketing. Foremost among them was the Selective Service Act of May 1917. For the first time there was legislation that specifically made a particular activity of women a federal offense and that was the women who were prostitutes around the army camps, and it was a movement to control venereal disease. Other new federal laws included the Harrison Narcotics Act, the Dyer-Carr Theft Act, and the Volstead Act prohibiting the sale of alcohol. In 
local prisons became overcrowded and increased their fees to house new federal inmates. The response from Washington came from a new and progressive assistant attorney general. She envisioned a federal women's prison that would satisfy both economy and humanity. Her name was Mabel Walker Willibrandt. Mabel Walker Willibrandt was charged with the, uh, the task of finding a location to build the first uh, federal prison for uh, women. Uh, the town of Alderson petitioned uh, f to have the prison placed here and in fact uh, gave to the government approximately 200 acres uh, on which to build a prison. The site was ideal. Alderson, West Virginia was the geographical center of the criminal population in the 20s. Its railroad line made it easily accessible for official visitors from Washington. And its setting, surrounded by mountains, offered a formidable obstacle to escape. Building began in 1924, with much of the labor done by inmates brought in from the federal penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas. What they built looked nothing like Leavenworth or any men's federal prison from the past. Those traditional penitentiaries were intimidating Gothic structures designed around a reform movement known as the Pennsylvania system. Under that system, inmates were subjected to a regimen of silence, penitence, and isolation. In contrast, Alderson looks like a college campus. Its designers closely followed the Georgian colonial architecture and layout of Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. It was hoped that this layout would facilitate a new philosophy of rehabilitation known as the cottage system. The idea was to, as nearly as possible, make a more home-like setting. And each cottage was equipped with a kitchen and a dining room and a living room and then uh, quarters for um, 30 inmates. When they first began, the warder lived in the cottage. So you had a very different relationship. You were recreating a domestic scene. The 16 red brick cottages were built two stories high and separated by groves of trees and shrubs. But the prison's most striking feature is that it was built without visible security. No wall surrounding it, no guard towers looming above. The women inmates would seemingly be free to walk away from their prison at any time. There are no fences, no walls, because you know, we hope and, and it's proven that the barriers that exist are in their, in their minds, and that's where they need to be. They need to realize that uh, the consequences of leaving uh, a place like this uh, would be dire in terms of where they would go next. On April 30th, 1927, with the prison still under construction, the first three inmates were led to their cottage. Although Alderson had not officially opened, this began a grand experiment in women's incarceration. Even as it was being finished, the new women's reformatory in Alderson, West Virginia, opened a fresh chapter in penology. Its planners envisioned it as a prison that would retrain its female inmates rather than punishing them. The first warden was Dr. Maribel Harris. Dr. Harris was identified with some of the early penologists in the United States. She was very much interested in an institution for women, run by women, and concerned with individuals. She had a PhD in Sanskrit from the University of Chicago. She was a concert pianist, and a very good one. By the end of 1927, there were 15 inmates at Alderson. Most were transferred from state prisons and workhouses where conditions for women had been even worse than for the men. Among the first changes they noticed was that their meals were served with napkins and tablecloths. 
One prisoner broke down and wept, saying she had been fed through bars for so long she forgot that people sat down in a dining room with china and linen. Warden Harris called these earliest inmates her settlers. Their first order of business was to prepare the cottages and buildings for the arrival of more prisoners. By June of 1928, the population at Alderson had grown to 200. The newest arrivals were mixed into cottages with older inmates so that they could learn the ropes from their peers. The population included prohibition violators, narcotics criminals, and women found guilty under federal prostitution laws. Some inmates were assigned jobs in the power sewing room, where they saw electric sewing machines for the first time. They learned to make their own prison uniforms, bed linens, tablecloths, and even the draperies that would hang on the cottage windows. Others were assigned work in agriculture. Now back in those days, they ran the dairy though, the women did. It looked like a football team from Notre Dame. And they ran the farm, and they did do a lot of the heavy kind of farm type work. The warden believed that jobs on the farm would give the women committed here a partnership with nature that would spark cooperation and cheerful labor. In order to detect an escape, Alderson began a unique tradition of prisoner counting that continues today. The bell ringing is a big part of Alderson history. It's been going on since the institution opened. Uh, being an old facility, we don't have a PA system to call our count. So every afternoon during the 4 o'clock count, our correctional officers still use an old-fashioned teacher's bell to call for the count. And that's a sign for the inmates to return to their rooms and uh, stand on the door and be prepared for the count. Uh, once the officers have counted the cottage, they ring the bell again, uh, indicating to the inmate that the count is clear and the inmates can... Uh, then disperse. By November of 1928, 18 months after the first inmates had arrived, building at Alderson was complete. The system was in place and Warden Harris called for a grand opening ceremony. Engraved invitations were sent to the governors of every state and to every member of Congress. The inmates readied their cottages for presentation. Even specific instructions on how to wax the floors had been printed and distributed for the inmates to follow. On November 24, 1928, 1,000 visiting dignitaries gathered on the lawn for the formal ceremonies. It was very ostentatious. The women's clubs of the United States had been involved in it and a lot of very prominent people. And it was a, a big uh, beginning of uh, the women's prison movement. The ceremony more resembled a college graduation than a ribbon cutting for a prison. The Star Spangled Banner was sung. The governor of West Virginia, Howard Gore, gave the dedication. The inmates then served the guests afternoon tea in the cottages. Some inmates even found themselves serving the judges and attorneys who had sentenced them to Alderson. All went according to plan. The inmates almost appeared to like it here. It was Warden Harris's belief that she was not just showcasing her new prison. Receiving visitors in the cottages would help the inmates cultivate a sense of hospitality. Many of the guests even chose to stay the night in unoccupied cottages. For one night, they experienced the austere simplicity of an inmate's room, a desk, a simple bed, a window, a dresser. Fifty years later, Bonnie Erford did time at Alderson on federal trespassing charges. She had been transferred from a maximum security prison. Her initial impression echoed that of Warden Harris's early settlers. When I first came to Alderson, I was 
I, I didn't want to hear anybody complain about anything because the rooms were spacious. There were two people to a room with bunk beds and there was a closet and there was a window that you could actually open and it was bright and airy and there was and there was green space outside. There were no fences with barbed wires. There were no guard towers. There was a bridge club and there were ethnic clubs and and there was a ceramic studio and you could be outside. You could literally walk around this nice green spacious area. But Alderson was very much a prison. Even in the absence of an outer wall, escape was nearly impossible. There was nowhere to go. In 1933, Alderson Women's Prison saw its population stabilize at 500 inmates. In addition to a regular schedule of work and education, there was a recreation building where the women were encouraged to participate in drama and musical performances or in the choir. Church attendance, however, was mandatory. Holidays like Christmas were observed and the women also put on a gala annual fair that was attended by the community. Visitors were treated to a parade of floats made by the convicts. In 1940, while the prison was still segregated, the so-called colored women's entry featured a scene of Aunt Jemima tossing pancakes. That was followed by a long line of white women in blue shirts. This saluted the sewing industry at the prison. Other inmates and staff wore carnival costumes and even the warden donned a humorous Napoleon outfit for the event. After a day like this, it was easy to forget that this was a prison. In 1933, Alderson received its first notorious offender. Catherine Kelly was the wife of bootlegger and bank robber George Machine Gun Kelly. Even before she bought her husband his first Tommy gun, Catherine had a family background in crime. One uncle was in Leavenworth for car theft. Another was a counterfeiter, her aunt was a prostitute, and her cousin was a bootlegger. Catherine herself had been arrested once for shoplifting. In July of 1933, the Kellys masterminded the kidnapping of oil millionaire Charles Urschel in Oklahoma City. Urschel was freed unharmed, but Catherine, her husband, and her mother, Ora Shannon, were arrested. They would be the first to be tried under Congress's new anti-kidnapping law, inspired by the abduction and murder of the son of Charles Lindbergh. It was the first time that newsreel cameras were allowed inside a federal trial, and it became one of the most exciting and publicized courtroom dramas of the era. Spectators were treated to a filmed reenactment of the kidnapping and a letter signed in blood threatening death to Urschel and his family if the Kellys were convicted. When the trial ended, the defendants were found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Catherine Kelly and her mother, Aura Shannon, were transported to Alderson. Bonnie Kirby was a guard when they arrived. Catherine and Aura were in the same building in separate rooms. They had private rooms. Uh, Aura worked in the greenhouse which was right next door to the cottage that she lived in. She was an older woman. She went to work and did her work over there with no supervision. And Catherine worked at, at that time, we called it the garment factory where they did sewing. The next famous inmate at Alderson did not come from the underworld. One of the more, shall we say, interesting or well-known residence at the institution was Billie Holiday, the famous jazz singer. I'm fooling myself and I mean it. Just fooling myself. In May of 1947, Holiday was arrested in Philadelphia on federal narcotics charges and sentenced to one year in prison. <laughs> 
At the time of her arrest, Holiday was among the most celebrated jazz singers in America. Her trademark voice remains instantly recognizable, and her story inspired the movie Lady Sings the Blues. But inside Alderson, Holiday was hardly noticed. She really, when she came here, went into the woodwork. I don't think anyone ever heard her sing a note. She didn't become involved in anything that was controversial. She just did her time and got out. The national paranoia that gripped America during World War II brought Alderson its first communist sympathizers and spies. Elizabeth Flynn had violated the Smith Act of 1940, which made teaching communism a federal crime. She was sent to Alderson for five years. Frances Gross came to Alderson in 1942 after she was convicted with her husband of spying for the Nazis. Teresa Behrens fainted in court when she was sentenced to 20 years at Alderson for violating the Wartime Espionage Act in 1944. Behrens had obtained U.S. Navy blueprints and code books during World War II and sent them to Germany. The post-World War II era brought two more infamous prisoners into Alderson's cottages. They were sent here for war crimes. Iva Taguri, a U.S. citizen, had become stranded in Japan during the war. She found a job broadcasting in English at the national radio station. Well, how are all my darling little dopes tonight? From this, she became known as Tokyo Rose, the sultry temptress who would broadcast propaganda to the GIs stationed in the Pacific. I mean when the war ended, she returned to the States where her broadcasts were labeled an act of treason. On September 29, 1949, Iva Toguri was convicted and sentenced to 10 years at Alderson Women's Prison. Iva was a fine gal. She was a lady and uh, very, very um, energetic. She kept a beautiful room and um, she was pleasant at all times and she had a way with the women she lived with, you know, she could take care of them, I mean, in a nice way. They all seemed to like her. She uh, was always busy. She didn't loaf, and she did a lot of leather work, like purses, things like that. She kept busy all the time. The prison's other war criminal was Mildred Gillers. Born in Ohio, Gillers dreamed of a life in the theater. In 1935, she found work in Germany broadcasting at Radio Berlin. By 1942, her propaganda program was aimed at Americans stationed in Europe. She called herself Midge at the Mic, but the GIs dubbed her Axis Sally. In March of 1949, federal prosecutors tried her for treason. She got 10 to 30 years at Alderson. She worked in the chapel most of the time that she was here. And you remember her particularly because she was always impeccably groomed. And uh, she was a actress of sorts. And uh, she had a, uh, a really upper class English accent, which she never lost, which I thought was interesting, consider her Midwestern roots. When the officers would unlock her door at night, she had long hair, and she would have her hair all down, you know, and sort of spook you. Gillers became eligible for parole in 1959. Initially, she waived that right, preferring prison to ridicule as a traitor on the outside. In 1954, Alderson received its first terrorist, Lolita Lebron. In March of that year, Lebron and three other Puerto Rican nationalists smuggled guns into the House of Representatives and opened fire from the visitors' gallery. Five congressmen were wounded. The attack was an outrage. Lebron and her partners were arrested and charged with plotting to overthrow the government. She was sentenced to 50 years at Alderson. <laughs> 
she received it was a very long sentence and uh, I had a great deal of contact with her she was a very religious person and I think that I can fairly say a very disturbed person she thought there was a light around her all the time and uh, she thought was afraid maybe that it would bother this light that was around her might bother other people during her time at Alderson, LeBron was never repentant. She told other inmates that she had meant to kill any congressman in range. Other than that, she was a model prisoner. I worked with Lolita a lot, and I talked to Lolita a lot. And she worked in dressmaking and arts, and she made all the hats at that time. The inmates wore hats when they went out, if they wanted one. And she made the hats and designed them, which were very nice. Like Mildred Gillers, LeBron also declined her first opportunity for parole. I think she waived her parole because she had failed in her attempt. And I think she was afraid to go back home because her party there might have killed her. Alderson had proved it could deal with spies, kidnappers, and terrorists, as well as any men's prison. But there was one troubling part of life here that Leavenworth and San Quentin never had to face. That was what to do with the babies born here. Alderson took a new approach to the confinement of female prisoners. Its founders hoped that by treating the women to a home-like setting, they would be reoriented toward a productive role in society. But it was still prison. As the population inside grew, so would the number of broken lives, desperate mothers, and children born in federal prison. In the beginning of the institution, the babies were born here. And for a short period, uh, they kept the babies here for maybe a year or so. It is a fact of life that some women were and still are sentenced to Alderson while they are pregnant. And the babies were kept in the cottages in a little bed and the mamas took care of them. But you know we all loved the babies when we worked in their cottages. At one time I know they were kept here until they were three or four years old because when I first came there was a playpen and a baby bed in the attic of every cottage. But from the beginning, there was always the question of what to do with the babies. The Bureau acted like they weren't here, in that they did not give us per capita money for them. And babies cost money. It cost money to feed them and to keep them. And so that was a bone of contention. In the 1960s, social workers from the Federal Department of Health and Human Services stepped in to address the problem. Now, I'm not sure just how much a, a baby is going to be aware of being in a prison, but the sense was we must rescue the children from the prison. Today, expectant mothers are taken to a nearby hospital for birthing and the children placed in foster care. They come to the prison's nursery only for visiting day. Still a disturbing feature of the prison remains, a small cemetery on the front lawn of the warden's house. That's babies that were born here and died, and they were buried over there. I, I, I don't know any reason that they were buried over there, except that the, they couldn't afford to send them home or uh, no one to send them to. Just a short walk from the cemetery is a stark reminder that Alderson has had its share of violent and unpredictable female convicts. To deal with them, the prison built Davis Hall. Surrounded by a security fence topped with razor wire, Davis Hall is a dramatic contrast to the cottages that house the majority of the inmates here. Its windows are screened in steel. Its cell doors are reinforced to provide maximum security. And that was the unit where we housed inmates who 
were not able to function in the general population. Uh, inmates who may have been assaultive, aggressive, predatory, uh, were taken to Davis Hall where they were housed uh, for the safety of, of themselves and for others. Davis Hall has housed some of Alderson's most notorious offenders. Lynette Squeaky Fromm was a disciple of convicted mass murderer Charles Manson. Although not indicted for his infamous killing spree in Los Angeles, she stood vigil outside his trial and became the Manson family leader in his absence. In 1975, during an outdoor public appearance, she pointed a loaded pistol at then-President Ford. Wrestled to the ground before she could fire, she was arrested, sentenced to life in prison, and sent to Alderson. Lynette was held on the second floor of Davis Hall, which was our jail within a jail, actually. And uh, she was there the whole time that I was working with her. Most of the time was fed in her room and lived there. That was her home. And she made it as comfortable as she could with in the limits that she was under, but she didn't have any freedom. Once a day, Frome was escorted to the yard behind Davis Hall, where she would enjoy one hour outdoors, surrounded by razor wire. She never seemed to mind being confined the way that she was. She never expressed to me any hopes of ever getting out. Eventually, Frome was allowed to join the general population of the prison. She met up with Sandra Good, her ex-roommate and fellow Manson family member. Good was serving 10 years in the prison for sending threatening letters through the U.S. mail. At Alderson, Sandra Good and Lynette Frome were permitted to dress in the familiar red and blue clothing that they had worn as members of the Manson family. They also received mail from Charles Manson. The incoming mail was always censored in the mail room. His was hard to read because he had only a third grade education and there were never any capitals, there were never any punctuations, it just ran on and on. <laughs> in December of 1987, the two received word that Manson was ill. Frome escaped, hoping somehow to see Manson, who was serving a life sentence in California. She never made it. Prison guards searched the rugged area around the prison with bloodhounds and after two days recaptured her as she emerged from the woods. Frome was ultimately transferred to the federal institution at Carswell, Texas, where she is serving out her life sentence. Good was released in 1986. By the 1970s, Alderson's cottages were filled to capacity with 975 female inmates. They were serving terms ranging from two years to life. But as the buildings and the philosophy behind them aged, a question emerged. How long could the prison without walls keep working? From the beginning, the prison staff at Alderson noted that while its female inmates were cut off from their husbands and families on the outside, they formed substitute families on the inside. More than a prison, Alderson became a society of women. There's a lot of lesbianism in a situation like this. And there would be a wife or a husband, um, sometimes a child, sometimes a wife-in-law was a weird expression to me. Now there is indeed homosexuality in women's institutions, there's no question about it. But for a significant number of these relationships, what you're basically recreating is not the sexual dimension of, of the relationship, but the dependency relation, the, the whole having someone to go to the, the movie with, um, someone you can talk to, someone that you can have an intimate relationship with. <laughs>
It was Alderson's cottage system that enabled these covert families to exist. I would presume that most of them would be in the cottages. I really would. It's, it's almost like little girls playing house. I mean, it really is. And, and they depend on each other for services. So what gets built up is your family member who works in the kitchen brings contraband food. The family member who works in the laundry puts good starch in. But the key one is often the, 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 uh, the relationship of uh, uh, husband-wife. Prison regulation made sex between inmates a punishable act. It was something we frowned on, of course. If we found two women in the same room with the door shut, they both went to Davis Hall. We controlled it as much as we could, but it still existed. While homosexuality is a constant in Alderson's history, there has also been gradual change here. By 1970, the inmates no longer cooked or ate meals in the cottages. Instead, a cafeteria capable of feeding the entire prison was added. Today, it provides a standardized menu in a centralized setting. Prison industry expanded from the original power sewing room to a large-scale garment factory. The inmates earn up to $63 per week and manufacture a variety of garments used by federal prisons across the country. The level of inmate cooperation also changed and after 44 years in operation, Alderson Women's Prison had its first and only riot. On September 12, 1971, Prisoners at New York's Attica State Prison made national headlines. They rioted and took guards hostage as they demanded better prison conditions. The scene became a bloodbath when National Guard troops were called in and opened fire, killing inmates and guards alike. People across America took up the cause and demonstrated against the use of such deadly force in prisons. The female inmates at Alderson caught the staff off guard when they joined in the popular protest. They went into a few of the cottages and tore up everything. They broke TVs, they ransacked rooms. They did a lot of material damage in a number of the places and they would build a fire in the middle of the lower campus and sit down there and holler about their demands and such things. It was a riot. Nobody has control over the, uh, over the group. You've got 800 women that are going and coming as they want to. We were unable to say to the group, go back in quarters. I mean, you could say it, but nothing happened. While there was little physical violence in the uprising, the potential for violence was very real. I was working in the dining room when the riot first started, and it is all glass, a one whole wall. And I was so worried that the troublemakers would attack us, not as individuals, but breaking the glass and such, but they was never touched. A SWAT team armed with tear gas, high-powered weapons, and riot gear was quickly assembled in nearby Lewisburg and brought to the prison. They quelled the disturbance without serious injury. Alderson was returned to order. The 1980s saw a new wave of prisoners at Alderson who had been arrested while protesting against the government. In the 1920s, it had been the women's vote. Six decades later, it was nuclear arms. Bonnie Erfer was arrested during a protest in 1987. I was in Alderson for trespassing on federal government property, the actual nuclear missile silos that are located in Missouri. Erfer spent 18 months at Alderson. Her experience reflects the prison's overall success story. 
I could have walked out any time I wanted to. I had to choose to stay in prison, which made it emotionally, personally, very difficult because in the process of doing resistance and for all of the reasons I was there, to have to self-inflict imprisonment for my actions made it more difficult. After 70 years, it can safely be said that even with no outer wall, this women's prison works. But now, the prison is in for a major change. We're in the process of building a new 500 uh, inmate living unit, and it is very different from what you see uh, around the institution now. It's going to be one large, massive building uh, with four floors, uh, as opposed to um, the two-floor small sort of independent cottages that we have around the institution right now. One by one, Alderson's cottages will be phased out in favor of the large prison-style housing unit. The primary reason for the change is economic. As the ornate cottages with their colonial-style accents grow older, the cost to renovate them, according to federal prison standards, is prohibitive. I think primarily from a cost-effective standpoint, it makes more sense to build one large building uh, that can house that number of inmates and do it efficiently. We're trying to be uh, good stewards of the taxpayers' money here and, and build a, a very functional uh, prison, but at the same time uh, limiting some of the amenities that you might have seen in the past. As the new building nears completion, the one question that has followed Alderson since the beginning comes up again. Will it work? Whether it was the removal of the kitchens and the dining rooms from the cottages to a central area. Sort of step by step through time, Alderson has shifted from that original pattern. Today, Alderson Women's Federal Reformatory is run by men. It will continue to house 850 female inmates well into the millennium. And there are no plans to build an outer wall. For the federal prisoners inside, life is likely to worsen. For the prison system, the grand experiment in women's incarceration may be about to end. <laughs>